Zelda has always had a weird relationship with its reception. Despite its positive reception and the now absolute reverence for its style, Wind Waker rocked the boat of Zelda early on in its life, where its cartoony art style turned many off before its release. While there was initially plans for a Wind Waker 2, it seems that due to reactions surrounding Wind Waker's style, the series would pivot direction again into a more realistic and darker world, hence The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. Initially a GameCube title, its development happened to push it into range to be a Wii launch title, so it was made so, and released almost simultaneously with the GameCube original version. To call a major launch title for a console releasing on the previous console at pretty much the same time weird is something of an understatement. To make it weirder, the game would go for a triple, appearing on Nintendo's next console as well, the Wii U, as Twilight Princess HD. There's a lot to it, so we'll just begin. Twilight Princess follows roughly the same story as every previous Zelda game, although it has a surprising emphasis on story this time around. The game presents its fairly basic story very well, with cutscenes that have much higher production value, improved cinematography, lively animation, and characters who manage to be endearing despite the material. Link, a young farmhand from Ordon, a village on the outskirts of Hyrule, has his quiet life shaken up when a gang of Baldwin, orc-like creatures, raid the village and kidnap the children. Giving chase, Link reaches a large black wall, and when he's pulled through, he's turned into a wolf. In this form, he's discovered by a strange imp, Midna, who decides to use him for her own gain in exchange for helping him become human again. The black walls are twilight, a dimension of darkness parallel to the ordinary world, and while inside it, Link becomes a wolf. Using the powers of various spirits of light that he rescues, Link pushes back the twilight while finding the fused shadows, a dark relic that allows its user to control the twilight, which Midna wishes to do to fix everything and overthrow the king of twilight, Zan, who's gained the power of Ganondorf after he was sealed in the Twilight Realm through a portal between the realms, the Mirror of Twilight. There's a lot more going on too, but I think that's a good start for the context going forward, so we'll come back to that. I will say though that there's a lot of interesting parallels to Ocarina of Time, which seems to be intentional. The gameplay is pretty much the same as other 3D Zeldas. Link has a sword and shield, and fights by using the L-targeting lock-on system. Combat has seen some improvement, with a variety of new moves from the start, and even more that can be found throughout the game. Link also accumulates a variety of other items with various uses, from puzzle solving to weapons to bottles to hold things in. The biggest change to Link's moveset is the wolf form. Early on this form is forced on Link and story related, although he eventually gains the ability to switch at will. While similar, Wolf Link's moveset is slightly different, mostly simplified, due to not having opposable thumbs to use a sword, shield, or items. In combat, Wolf Link can bite, lunge, or use an attack that creates an area of effect and automatically strikes all enemies in range. Twilight Princess has a large overworld that connects the various major locations, primarily the dungeons. Between dungeons, Link will often have to do various tasks for characters to remove obstacles in his path. Twilight Princess is fairly infamous for its large gaps between dungeons, especially early on, but there's a good variety of things to do in these sections, and most of the story happens here too. These out-of-dungeon segments tend to lean heavily on exploration as opposed to pure puzzle solving, broken up with occasional combat. There's also a wide array of side content in the overworld, from minigames like the cannon launch at Lake Hylia and fishing, to collectibles like golden bugs and post souls. Inside the dungeons, the game is much more focused in general. Dungeons are laid out as a series of rooms, with most rooms having some sort of puzzle as well as combat, hindering progress to the next room or to a chest with a key or a key item. Puzzles early in the dungeon will usually reinforce the usage of the newest item, while every dungeon has a new item that's usually used to solve the puzzles in the later half. While exploration is still a factor, it's pushed more to the back, as the dungeons are fairly linear with one pre-planned path, although it's not necessarily a straight line through. Each dungeon has its own theme, various secrets to find, usually in the form of extra rupees or pose, and of course a boss, which is usually fought using the new dungeon item. It's the basic Zelda formula done really, really well. It's fun and the changes keep it lively, but as I always do, I'll expand on a lot of these later when I'm covering the other aspects of the game. Control's not a simple topic to tackle. On GameCube and Wii U, everything is pretty good. Link controls well, his basic stuff hasn't changed from Wind Waker, A for actions, B for sword, L for target, run into a ledge to jump, and X and Y for items, with Wii U adding an extra slot on Z. The game has an adjustable camera with C, and it all feels really good. The Wii is going to be the contentious part, though. Aiming the bow or slingshot with the pointer feels pretty good, but the waggle is going to get some people turned off from it. Swinging Link Sword is done by shaking the Wii Remote. It's natural enough, and I don't mind, but I know how some people feel about that. The Fishing Rod is another big one, as the fishing minigame on GameCube is just kind of holding down the C-Stick. Well, it's even more waggling on the Wii. The game controls really well regardless of platform, but I think most people are going to want to avoid the Wii version due to the motion controls. On the topic of difficulty, the game is very smart with guiding. It's hard to get lost because the game does a very good job of facilitating discovery, but the puzzles and dungeons are definitely more complex than usual. 
Dungeons usually average out to be about an hour in length, and some like the Water Temple have very complex layouts, and even some new types of puzzles like moving iron balls between rooms in Snow Peak. Puzzles have a great difficulty, which makes that element way more satisfying. That said, combat ain't great in the difficulty regard. The new moves are all optional, which means the game's combat can't be built around it, and having the moves just makes combat easier and faster. There are some areas that are pretty hard, like the optional Cave of Ordeals, which is built around difficulty, but that's mostly because of resource deprivation. Bosses are also pretty much jokes. Their attacks do roughly the same as a regular enemy, but they attack far less frequently and usually go down in three cycles of whatever damages them. Regardless, the combat isn't really the main focus in this, or any Zelda game for that matter, so the game's difficulty comes out looking pretty good if just for the dungeons, if nothing else. Twilight Princess looks so fucking good. While the bloom in some areas, especially in the twilight, can be a bit much, most things are just mmm. Monsters and enemies have been redesigned to have more realistic appearances that I think look really cool for the most part. The darker, grittier visuals really convey the sort of somber tone the game has, although I'd also like to note here that I don't think the game is dark or edgy, as it does have pretty hopeful messages. I think the tone is more one of desperation and somberness that I think works really well. The game also has fantastic animation, especially with characters and cutscenes. Characters are expressive and even downright funny at times, made even better by some of the wild character designs, like this little Midge Mallow and Louis CK as the bombster guy. The Gorons and their hyper-realistic nipples disturb me though. The Twilight and their magic world have a really cool techno-fantasy thing going on, with these blue lines through everything, blue straight lines. The game is also far more cinematic, with true cutscenes that look fucking amazing and have some really wild visuals like... And... <laughs> Don't even get me started on the music, too. It's such a shame it isn't orchestrated because the soundtrack is fucking amazing. Top three ever, easily. Every single track is beautiful and wonderfully made and dynamic. Even the songs that get a little overused, like the battle theme, are really good, but songs like Midna's Lament, Hyrule Field, Temple of Time, and so many more are just... So good. You need to listen to it. It's it's really good. A lot the music is going to be playing throughout the background of this video as well. Now to cover the actual game. If you've played a Zelda game before, the general plot won't be too unfamiliar. Although since the game is slightly more story centric, I will say light spoilers here. The game starts at its most controversial segment. Twilight Princess's intro is infamous for its length and relative lack of action. Now's the part where I kind of go to bat for it. The intro serves two important purposes. First is narrative. Unlike movies, games have the benefit of having the time to waste two hours setting up the life of the common man to better show the impact of things getting bad. This element of the intro is very strong. The simple life of Wardon is comforting and lovely, and the sharp contrast of fears the Twilight encroaches is really good world building. The other thing the intro does is front load all the tutorializing. This is kind of a mixed bag. On one hand, it prevents the game from having to stop at various points to teach the player basic game elements, and mixing this with the narrative stuff helps the rest of the game flow far better. On the other hand, this front-loading may put off some players, as the intro could definitely use a little trim, and it makes repeat playthroughs really drag on. With that out of the way, I'm gonna do what the game doesn't, and make the intro kind of fast. <laughs> Russell wants Link to carry an ornamental sword to Hyrule Castle as an offering to the princess. Fado needs help with the goats, Link needs to find Epona, to get Epona from Ilya he needs to play a song on weird horse grass that can be used to call Epona to Link at any time later, which teaches the music mechanic that comes into play for obtaining the hidden skills as well. Then Link helps herd the goats, a tedious minigame centered on shouting the goats into the pen, but one that does a fairly good job of teaching control over Epona. The next day, Link gets harassed by the kids about a slingshot in the store. The store is closed because the owner's cat is missing. The cat is missing because it got yelled at for stealing fish and it wants to catch a new one. 
To solve this whole mess, Link needs to talk to a guy to learn to L-target, climb up to him on vines, use hawk grass to call a hawk, which is aimed and thrown like the bow and slingshot, more tutorializing in a clever and subtle way, then throw another hawk at a monkey holding a baby basket, grab the basket, take it to Russell's wife, she gives Link a fishing rod, he can then fish at the dock to catch a fish, which in the Wii U version the cat steals, but in the Wii and GameCube version Link needs to catch a second fish for the cat, then Link can run all over town scrounging up 30 rupees and buy the slingshot, finally. Then there's a slingshot tutorial, which also serves as a basic tutorial for all the shooting in the game. After this, Link gets the wooden sword and is taught the basics of the game's combat. The three children then chase a monkey into the woods, and the intro strongly improves here and becomes more of an interlude than a tutorial, so I'll slow down a little bit. One of the kids, Tallow, has chased the monkey into Faron Woods. Tallow has somehow made it through the pitch black path ahead, and to pass through, Link will need to get the lantern from the cool afro guy nearby. He's a lantern oil salesman and has a pretty funny line about giving away free lanterns as a sales tactic. Outside of lighting the path, the torch can also be used to burn down certain barricades like spider webs, and also light pedestals which sometimes hide secrets throughout the game, although it slowly drains oil and will require refills which usually cost money. Various enemies start to appear here, primarily Deku Baba, large plants who can be killed by cutting them from their stems, Bokoblins, little goblins with clubs, and Keese, basically bats. While Faron Woods isn't a dungeon, it does introduce the elements slightly, primarily finding the small key and using it to pass in the next area. Tal and the monkey have been captured by Macoblins in front of the game's first dungeon, the Forest Temple. After freeing them, Link returns to town. This is the part where a bit of wariness from the intro will probably start to set in. So close to the dungeon, but still so far. The next day, Link has to herd the goats again. I have no idea why this is here. It's really redundant. Out of everything that happens in this intro, herding again feels the most like filler. Ilya, the mayor's daughter, again steals a Pona and takes her to the pond, but to return to the grove she's taken to, the kids demand Link's wooden sword. When Link arrives, King Bulblin, a giant bokoblin on a giant boar, shows up and kidnaps Ilya and Russell's cowardly son Colin. When Link wakes up from being knocked out, he chases after them and finds the Twilight Wall. Link is pulled in by a shadow beast and is transformed into a wolf before passing out. When he wakes up, he's trapped in Hyrule Castle's dungeon and meets Midna, his companion for the rest of the game. She has a bit of charm, even here, challenging Link to free himself before she'll let him help her. She's certainly a huge step up from the fairies of the previous games and only gets better as more is learned about her. Hyrule Castle is within the twilight and as such is swarmed with monsters, and as Link is a wolf, he won't get much help from the humans in the castle anyway. This section is essentially an extended tutorial for Wolf Link's abilities, digging for secrets and passages, using sense to spot invisible things, jumping to points with Midna, and his slight combat changes. By climbing through the sewers and around the outside of the building, Link can reach the Hyrule Castle Tower. In the tower, Princess Zelda explains how the Twilight began to invade, and Midna transports Link back to the World of Light, although he's still stuck as a wolf, in order to help her find the fused shadows to stop the Twilight. Before she'll help though, Midna wants him to obtain a sword and shield to prove his worth, in a fun segment where the Ordon villagers will fear and attack Link, and he must non-violently deal with or avoid them to steal the required items. Afterwards, Link meets the first Spirit of Light, Ordana, who informs him that the other Spirits of Light can help him repel the Twilight, although the Spirits of Light need to have their essences recovered after being attacked by evil creatures. Midna pulls Link through the Twilight Wall, and he has his first fight with the Shadow Beasts. Shadow Beasts have a unique mechanic in that they're always fought in groups, and when all but one are down, they'll regenerate, meaning Link must take down at least two in one attack, easiest done by charging Midna's area of effect attack to hit all three at once, or in later fights, whittling down ones that are out of reach from the others before striking the final set. As a reward, every time Link takes down a set of Shadow Beasts, it'll create a warp portal that can be used for fast travel. Link then meets Faron, the spirit of Faron. Faron is weakened, and to restore him, Link must do the first bug hunt. The bug hunts are pretty bad. Link must track down invisible bugs, use his senses to spot them, and kill them to recapture the Tears of Light. All 16 bugs, 12 on the Wii U version, thank god, are marked on the map, but it's still fairly tedious, especially considering the sheer amount of stuff this intro already has going on in it. A few of the insects are in cool spots, like the Afro Dude's house, but using Midna's jumps to go through Faron Woods for bugs, and especially getting all the way to the Forest Temple entrance for the second time is just... Ugh. After getting all the tears, Faron is restored and returns Link to his regular form. Finally, he can make his last trip through Faron Woods, where the monkey will show up and steal his lantern. The monkey will then very slowly swing the lantern around to ward off the poisonous fog and lead Link to the other side. Very, very slowly. 
So close to the first dungeon, but still so far. Directly in front of the forest temple, Link meets a golden wolf who turns into the hero's spirit. The hero's spirit is the ghost of Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask Link, who regrets not passing on his knowledge. Who, after this mandatory encounter, can be summoned optionally by howling at certain stones to teach Link new moves. In this case, he teaches Link the finishing blow, a move that allows him to instantly finish off opponents who have been knocked to the ground. Finally, after all of this, Link can enter the game's first dungeon, the Forest Temple. This is the first of many points of similarity to Ocarina of Time, getting the sword and shield to enter a temple in a tree, although the journey there was much longer. If you've ever wondered why people find Twilight Princess's intro so, uh, bad, you may have a clearer idea now. The forest temple is still a little tutorial-y, as throughout, the female monkey will lightly guide Link through the dungeon to help her free her fellow monkeys. These monkeys also form chains to swing Link across gaps. The more monkeys freed, the further he can go. A few other elements are tossed in too, like walking bomb bugs that turn into bombs when attacked, which can be used to remove rocks or even enemies, and large rotating bridges. In outdoor areas, these bridges will periodically rotate with the wind, allowing Link to progress with some patience. Midway through the dungeon, Link encounters the game's first mid-boss, Ook. Ook is the leader of the monkeys, who's been possessed by a bug in his big, juicy monkey ass. He has a large boomerang he tosses at Link and can be opened up for attack by rolling into the pillar he stands on to knock him off balance, causing him to miss catching the boomerang. After repeating a few times, Ook is freed from his possession and runs off, leaving Link the boomerang, which reawakens the fairy in the boomerang and turns it into the gale boomerang. The gale boomerang works similarly to the boomerang in prior games, but has the additional property of a wind effect that can turn fans like on the bridges or carry items to Link, as well as having the option to lock onto multiple targets and hit them in order for puzzle solving. After defeating Ook, Link needs to use his new Gale Boomerang to rescue the remaining monkeys by turning the bridges. Once every single monkey is rescued, the whole group swings Link across to the boss's room, where he goes against the Twilight Parasite, Diababa, a giant three-headed Dekubaba. At first, Link needs to knock out its smaller head by using the Gale Boomerang to carry bomblings into them. When the larger head appears, the platforms with the bomblings are destroyed, but in a great use of the dungeon's monkey friendship theme, Ook will begin to swing back and forth carrying bombs, which can be targeted and steered at the heads to open up the main head for attack. Once Diababa is defeated, Link gets the first fused shadow, and Midna promises to tell him more when he finds the others, as well as a heart piece that increases maximum health. And with that, the first dungeon is cleared in roughly 2-3 hours for the average player. Exhausting. It is a very solid first dungeon though, and a good tutorial to dungeons that doesn't feel like one. Outside of the dungeon, Faron sends Link and Midna to find the next Spirit of Light, Elton, located in Kakariko Village at the base of Death Mountain, another Ocarina parallel. On the way there, Link, again a wolf, finds a broken bridge, and must warp to a large bridge in Faron Woods and back to replace it, a tutorial for this type of puzzle that comes up occasionally in the game's fast travel system. In Kakariko, he must again collect the Tears of Light. This bug hunt is definitely the best of the three, as most of the bugs are hidden in the houses of Kakariko, with small puzzles for getting into the houses, and puzzles inside, like lighting a stick on fire to light torches around a room. Blowing up the bomb store room with the same method is a really goofy twist on that as well. Near the bugs that are on Death Mountain is the first Howling Stone, which will awaken the hero's spirit, allowing Link to learn a new move when he has time to get to him later, the shield attack that can break enemy defenses. Near the final bug, a giant burning meteor crashes into the ground near Link for... something. It comes back up. Once he gets all the bugs, he restores Elden, who tells him the fused shadows with the Gorons on top of Death Mountain, and Link is returned to human form before reuniting with the Ordon kids, save Ilya. On the route up Death Mountain, a Goron will assault Link and push him back to the bottom, where Renato, the village shaman, will guide him to the one hilly in the Gorons respected, Mayor Bo of Ordon, Ilya's father. Upon returning to Ordon, Bo will teach Link the sumo minigame that I'm too brainlit for. A pushes the opponent, but can be countered by dodging left or right, but dodging can be countered by slapping with B, which is countered by pushing, I think. Throwing Bo out of the ring twice rewards Link with his secret weapon to even the odds with Gorons, the Iron Boots, which are thankfully an item in this game which allows for quick swapping, and outside of making Link heavier and slower, and the classic use of sinking in water, the Iron Boots also have another really cool property in the dungeon, but I'll hold my tongue for a second. Upon returning to Kakariko, King Bulblin reappears, and Colin pushes another kid to safety, getting himself recaptured. Twilight, Prince Twilight Princess introduces horse combat, where Link can swing his sword off either side of a pony while riding, and must get alongside Bulblin to attack him, until finally confronting him on the bridge of Elden in a joust. 
Link must dodge left or right and strike Baldwin to throw him off the bridge and rescue Colin, who has a cute arc about being more brave like Link, told nicely in only a few scenes. Finally, Link can begin his climb up Death Mountain, although the Malamartin town, run by the Midge from Ordon, also now sells the Hillian Shield, a metal shield that won't burn up when hit by fire attacks, which helps a lot inside of a volcano. Link can finally climb Death Mountain using the Iron Boots to grapple with rolling Gorons, and with a fun little mechanic where he can attack Gorons to roll them into balls and then stand on top of them, where the force of them popping back out of their balls launches him up to higher elevations. At the top of the mountain, Link meets the Goron Elder Gorkoron and his hyper-realistic nipples, who calls off... <laughs> who calls off the others and challenges Link to a sumo match, which requires the Iron Boots to complete. Upon beating him, he informs Link that the leader of the Gorons, Darbus, has become possessed by the Fused Shadow, who is sealed away by the Elders at the heart of the next dungeon, Goron Mines. To reach Darbus, Link must meet each Elder and get a portion of the broken key to go knock some sense into him. The mines are filled with lava, which often shoots up plumes of lava, requiring a lot of timing-based puzzles to navigate, even down to a timed timing challenge with a slowly closing door and fire-based enemies all over. Link must travel through in a fairly straight line between the Elders, Gor Amato, Gor Abizo, and Gor Ligs. The Iron Boots are used heavily throughout not only to sink in water, but to walk on magnetic platforms to some pretty cool effects. Moving magnetic cranes can pull Link up and move him around, and he may have to jump into a magnetized beam to get pulled to walls. He can also use most of his items on the ceilings and walls for combat and puzzles. My only real complaint with this mechanic is that the magnetic sections are a bit slow and probably could have afforded a little speed up. Midway through, Link has to do a pseudo-sumo battle with the mid-boss, a really bulky Goron named Durango. Which, might I add, it's really cool that the major Gorons all have individual looks now, and each elder being really weird, like the little volcano dude with the rock beard. Dangoro fights on a magnetic rocking platform on lava that shifts with his and Link's weight. When Dangoro gets set to attack, Link can swing at him to put him in a ball and then lob him backwards off the platform three times, after which he recognizes Link's strength and finally understands he's an ally, gifting him the hero's bow, which does pretty much what one would expect. Point and shoot to hurt enemies and activate switches from range. There's even a switch in this dungeon that requires being on the ceiling to shoot it. Once all three elders are met, Link can recombine the key and find Darbus, now Twilight Igniter Phyrus. Phyrus is huge and really cool looking, and his fight, while ridiculously easy, combines both of the dungeon's major items. Shoot Phyrus in the face with an arrow, throw on the iron boots, pull on one of the chains on his ankles to trip him, and then stab him in the head a couple times and repeat. He's kind of a joke, but he's a cool joke. Once he's defeated, Link takes the fused shadow and heart container, ready to find the final piece and end everything. Goron Mine has some really fun gimmicks, although it is a touch too easy for a second dungeon. After warping out of the dungeon, Link is transported to Elden's Pond, who asks him to go revive Lanairu. Bombs in the bomb bag are now available from barns, which are needed to get into Lanairu province on the map. Upon crossing the Bridge of Elden and bombing the rocks in the way, the bridge is destroyed, locking Link on this side of Hyrule for the time being. After becoming Wolf Link again, Link can track Ilya's scent all the way out of Hyrule Castletown, hopefully to find his friend. In Castletown, the scent leads Link to Telma's Bar, a woman who has taken in Ilya, and also runs a small group of people fighting against the Twilight. Ilya is tending to a sick Zora in the bar, and the soldiers inside reveal that the Spirit of Light, Lanairu, rests in Lake Hylia. The lake itself is dried up, and an ambush on the bridge forces Link to jump into what's left of it. At the bottom of the lake, Link is attacked by the mid-boss, Twilight Carrier Kargarok, a giant twilight bird with an archer on the top. The battle is basically just attacking it until the rider dies, at which point Midna hops on Kagarok and picks up Link to carry him to the source of the river to find what's causing it to dry up. There's a somewhat awkward minigame with iffy controls flying the bird up the river, probably could have done without it. At the top is Zora's domain, once again frozen solid just like in Ocarina. After climbing the waterfall with Midna's jump, Link enters Zora's domain, also frozen over, but he can use the big hot rock from Death Mountain to be thought, not only freeing their Zora, who realized the prince is missing, but refilling Lake Hylia. Queen Rutella's ghost, who was executed by Xant, asks Link to find her son before he leaves, offering to give Link the power to breathe underwater in exchange, although he can only complete this task when he returns to his regular form, so it's time for a bug hunt once again. The bug hunt this time extends from Lake Hylia, back up the Zora River on the bird, which has bugs on the flight up, meaning missing it means repeating the whole section again, up to Zora's domain where Link can howl at another Howling Stone for the back slice, which lets Link get behind enemies, then down to Castletown. After collecting 15 bugs, 11 on Wii U, Midna realizes they're one short, and it appears on the map in the center of Lake Hylia. In the middle of the lake is the final bug in the game, the Twilight Bloat, a giant version of the shadow insects. It's a nice little subversion of the bug hunts. 
The bloat will charge at Link, who is stuck on four small platforms, and after the charge, Link can lunge at it. Once it's hit three times, he can use Midna's energy field to tear off all of its limbs and finally restore Lanairu. Lanairu explains the backstory of the Fused Shadow, which a group of interlopers used to try to rule the Sacred Realms, leading to them being banished to the Twilight Realm and becoming the Twilight, Midna's ancestors. He also warns Link of the dangers of the artifact in a scene that shows some really cool and cinematic storytelling, which really cements how hard the team worked to try to enhance the story. Back in Toma's bar, Link finally reunites with Ilya, who has lost all of her memories. The Zora she was tending to earlier is Prince Rayless. And to cure his illness, Link will need to escort a horse-drawn carriage to Renato and Kakariko. To cross Elden, Link will have to again joust King Baldwin, but this time Baldwin has shields on both of his arms, meaning Link will need to first throw him off balance by shooting him with the bow. From there, Link must use the horse combat and bow to stop the carriage's destruction from bokoblin, birds, and other things while following the cart in circles for a little over five minutes. In Kakariko Village, with her son safe with Renato, Rutella's ghost guides Link to her husband's grave to get the Zora armor, allowing him to breathe underwater and swim anywhere. Link will also need to visit barns to get water bombs, which work underwater. Finally, Link can reach the bottom of Lake Hylia and blast open the entrance to the lake bed temple. Like its Ocarina counterpart, the Water Temple, the main gimmick of this dungeon revolves around multiple floors and moving water. The dungeon is built around a central room with a staircase that rotates towards Link whenever he pulls a hanging switch. The staircase also serves to move running water down into the other side of the room to change the water level in various rooms or turn water wheels and gears to open up some movement options. On top of usage of the iron boots, the dungeon also forces the use of bomb arrows made by combining bombs and arrows to knock down stalactites. The dungeon's mid-boss, the Deku Toad, is a large toad that jumps at Link and spawns Toad Polis to harass him. While Link can use bombs or bomb arrows to speed up its cycles, he can also simply dodge its slam attacks to get it to reveal its tongue and slash away. It's a little silly that it doesn't require bombs as it makes it fairly easy, and it spawns enemies that could drop bombs if they are really needed. Defeating the Deku Toad gives Link the absolutely amazing claw shot. The claw shot is the evolution of the hook shot, and while it functions mostly the same, dragging Link to grabbable targets, it's often used far more creatively and far more often than in past games, as Link can raise and lower his elevation, and this dungeon and many after use moving targets to help him get around. Once the central room is fully flooded, Link can make his way to the boss, Morpheal, who's fought in a unique area at the absolute bottom of the lake, completely underwater. Twilight Aquatic Morpheal is something of an evolution of Ocarina's water temple boss, Morpha. At the start, Morpheal has eight tentacles that swing at him periodically while the single eye travels up and down through them. As always, the dungeon item, the claw shot, is used on the boss to pull the eye out of the tentacles and weigh on it. While this strategy was enough for Morpha, at this point, Morpheal reveals its final form, crawling out of the sand as a giant eel. While it looks cool, it kind of just swims around in circles and only hurts Link if he's dumb enough to get into contact with him, but I just love the scale of this boss. From here, Link must grapple to the eye that's now embedded on the monster's back and then simply mash attack. It has a Shadow of the Colossus vibe, but kind of lacks the fun of the actual climb. With Morpheal gone, Link and mine to get the final piece of the fused shadow. Midna and Link return to Lanairu's cave, but are ambushed with the first appearance of the King of Twilight, Xant. Xant is made appropriately threatening here, his appearance is threatening as is, but when his mask raises to reveal his pointed teeth, it's actually pretty chilling. Not only that, but he almost kills Midna and reverts Link back to his wolf form with a crystal, and the duo are only saved by Lanairu warping them outside of Castletown. Midna is too weak to help in combat or give advice, and a beautiful piece of music, Midna's Lament, plays that sets the tone of direness over the whole scene. The one criticism I have is a fairly common one. The battle music overrides Midna's Lament, which is a ridiculous oversight that would have been incredibly easy to fix. Telma's Bar is a passage to Hyrule Castle, but Link will have to avoid people as he travels, as his wolf form is now in the Light World and as such is visible to others. After the bar, Link ends up in Giovanni's house, a strange man who made a deal with a demon that turned him into a golden statue. Giovanni's a bit of a goofball and always calls Link Doggy, while also informing him of Poe's, ghosts that have taken pieces of his soul, and by returning them to him, he rewards Link with goods. In this game, Poe's can only be seen while sensing with Wolf Link, and Link must kill the first Poe to proceed past Giovanni. Through Giovanni's room, Link ends up back in the Hyrule sewers and can climb back to the roof, and into the tower to visit Zelda. Zelda attempts to return Link to his normal form but fails, and asks him to find the Master Sword in the Sacred Grove. She also seems to realize something about who Minna is, and that despite her attitude, Minna has the world's interest at heart and decides to transfer her soul into Minna, restoring her but causing Zelda to disappear. Minna's reaction to this action is very, very well done.
With a goal in mind, Link and Midna as a giant magical barrier surrounds Hyrule Castle, and return to Faron Woods, where not far from the Forest Temple, they reach the Sacred Grove. In the Sacred Grove, there are two Howling Stones, one that gives him the Helm Splitter, a move that attacks enemies from above after a shield attack that honestly shreds most enemies, and one to summon Skull Kid. While not the same gimmick, the maze-like area is again navigated by falling Skull Kid, this time by the flicker of his lantern in the distance instead of his music, which is a new fantastic remix of the Lost Woods song. Throughout the woods, Link fights Skull Kid as a mid-boss, striking him in the maze while he summons puppets to harass Link, then again in the small boss arena where he must attack him while he's summoning puppets so he doesn't warp away. In order to finally reach the sword, Link will also need to solve a puzzle where he moves two statues into place by hopping between blocks, one that hops in the same direction as him and one that moves in the opposite. It's a tricky little mind teaser and I like it, but I can definitely see why some people found it really frustrating. Once Link draws the Master Sword, he's reverted to his normal form, but the crystal Zant used to curse him is also ejected. And as such, Midna can use it to switch Link between his two forms at will, which is used as a central mechanic throughout the rest of the game. From here, Link can warp freely at any time, and as such has most of the world pretty opened up to him, including most of the rest of the Howling Stone's heart pieces, most of the bugs, and a good portion of the pose, as well as the Malamart side quest, donating money to help Malamart open a store in Hyrule Castle to unlock the magic armor, which prevents Link from taking damage at the cost of rupees. In Telma's Bar, Link meets the other members of the Resistance, including Link's mentor Russell, who asks him to find one of their members, Aru, who is above Lake Hylia. Aru explains the Mirror of Twilight, an artifact that serves as the portal between the Light and Twilight, which would be instrumental in stopping Xant, and helps Link reach the Gerudo Desert, where he must go to the Arbiter's Ground. An abandoned prison built to host the worst criminals in Hyrule, including at one point Ganondorf, who was banished to the Twilight using the Mirror. The desert is a large area filled with Bokoblin camps, who will continuously spawn unless Link can take down the archers in the watchtowers with his bow. You can also learn the next skill, Mortal Draw, here if he's found another Howling Stone, which deals massive damage to enemies at some risk. After getting through the base, Link encounters King Boldlin again, and this time he must fight him on foot, although he crumbles to backslashes and is absurdly easy. After escaping the Fire Boldlin sets, Link arrives at the doorstep of the Arbiter's Ground. This dungeon can be loosely compared to the Ocarina's Spirit Temple, not only in its location, but in its usage of both of Link's forms in their respective games. In the first area, Link must track down four Poes who block his passage, using a mixture of wolf scent tracking and his claw shot mostly, while also contending with more dangerous enemies such as the Gibdo, who can stun him with their screams and attack for free. The dungeon also heavily features quicksand, which Link slowly sinks into, although if he's fast, he can cross it to further areas. One particular section requires Link to navigate a maze of spikes that rise from the floor while also being slowed down by ghoul rats. The mid-boss is Death Sword, a really cool looking demon ghost who's sealed in his own sword at first. Unfortunately, like most bosses, Death Sword kinda comes off as a joke. The first phase is attacking him as Wolf Link after he gets his sword stuck in the ground, and then afterwards just harassing him with arrows until he decides to get stuck again. Once Death Sword is dead, or re-dead, Link gets the Spinner, a really really cool item that falls prey to a huge complaint about Twilight Princess, that after Arbiter's Ground it becomes virtually useless. The Spinner's primary use is that it allows Link to pass over quicksand and to grind and hop between certain rails. It's really fun to use, but it's more of a navigation tool with a few timing challenges rather than actually useful in puzzle solving. At the center of the Arbiter's Ground, Link finds a gigantic skeleton embedded in the floor, and Xan warps in to show off as a threat again, using a cursed sword to revive it into the boss. Twilight Fossil Stallord. Stallord's first phase is in a large circular arena where Link must boost off the rails to launch himself into Stallord's spine, with each hit increasing the number of enemies that he must dodge to reach it while still maintaining enough speed to damage him. Once Stallord's body is destroyed, Link can raise the room up which leads to Stallord's head waking up. At this point, Link must grind up the vertical rails on the outside of the room to catch Stallord while dodging spikes and fireballs to bash into his head, finally ending him and allowing Link to reach the roof of the Arbiter's Ground. 
On top of the building, Link meets the sages, who have fascinating new designs with their disconnected, floating faces, who inform Link that the Mirror of Twilight has been shattered by Zans, who as the False King can't destroy it completely but has scattered its pieces, leading to the second MacGuffin quest, although it's one that really expedites the process with far shorter interludes. From Telma's bar, Link learns that Ashe is investigating why Zora's domain froze over. Bordering on Zora's domain is Peak Province, a frozen tundra which is unusually cold for the time, and Ashe presents Link with a drawing of a yeti catching a red fish. Showing this drawing to the Zora in the area, I have them recognize the fish as a reek fish, which only Prince Raelis knows how to catch, who's still in Kakariko. Raelis gives Link his earring, which is made from a rare coral that reek fish feed on, allowing Link to catch a reek fish and then sniff it, and then track its scent with Wolf Link to follow its trail through the tundra. From here, Link simply needs to follow the scent to the yeti, Yeto. There's also a Howling Stone for the Jump Strike, which is a charged version of the Jump Attack, much like the Spin Attack. And because I'm unsure where to bring this up, the final hidden skill can also be gotten here-ish, the Great Spin. A stronger Spin Attack Link automatically uses when at full health. Yeto is more than happy to meet Link, and asks Link to follow him home by snowboarding down the mountain on a frozen leaf. The snowboarding minigame isn't very good. It only needs to be completed once, unless going for hard pieces because there's one tied behind a re-race. But it controls kind of bad. Link seems magnetically drawn to cliffs on turns, which kind of makes it feel like the player's fighting against the game. Once it's over, Link arrives at Yeto's home, which also happens to be the next dungeon, Snow Peak Ruins, a rundown mansion. Yeto has found the shard of the Mirror of Twilight and wants Link to take it, but has locked it away, believing it's made his wife, Yetta, ill. As such, the dungeon has one of the most unique layouts of any in the series. Yeto is busy cooking soup for his wife to help her recover, and Yeto will direct Link around different segments of the dungeon to find the key. Unfortunately, due to her illness, she misremembers where the key is, and each section Link is sent to instead rewards him with an ingredient for the soup, which he can give to Yeto to improve the soup, eventually turning it into a pretty powerful healing item, which can be held in jars. Despite being something of a wild goose chase, each passel gives Link a few new things. Being a snow level, there's some heavy snow sections that Wolf Link must dig around in, ice block sliding puzzles, and a unique gimmick of using cannons and cannonballs to destroy large ice barriers. These cannonballs can't be carried through doors, but can be shot over walls or passed through these weird little transporters to the other side of a wall, and some cannonballs are carried throughout almost the entire level. On top of that, there's of course a new dungeon item, wielded by the mid-boss Darkhammer, a large lizard-like creature that stomps towards Link while swinging a huge ball and chain. When Link claw shots behind him, he'll toss the ball, allowing Link to get some hits in from behind. Once Darkhammer is down, Link steals his ball and chain, which is another dungeon item that suffers from Spinner Syndrome. The new item is both a weapon, albeit a pretty slow and clunky one, so slow that, while good against Slow Peak's enemies that it takes down one hit, it's almost virtually useless outside of it, and also as a tool for smashing ice barriers that the cannons can't hit, or moving these large swinging platforms. While it is kind of fun to use, its slowness really weighs it down, making it situational even inside of its own dungeon. After finding the bedroom key, Yetta will appear to Link and guide him to the third floor, apparently feeling better because of the soup. Unlike other dungeons, this room isn't marked as a boss room, and it seems to be the end, but before Link can take the mirror, its influence transforms Yetta into the Twilight Ice Mask Blizzetta. The windows shatter and freeze the room over, including the floor, making it slippery. In her first phase, she acts much like the mini freezer enemies common in the dungeon. When struck with the ball and chain, she'll be launched away, bouncing off the walls until she returns to Link and repeating until her second phase begins. The second phase is the real fight, as Blizzetta will float above him, and Link must use the reflection on the floor to avoid the large ice stones she drops on him. After they've landed, Link has an opportunity to smash these pillars before her second attack, dropping the remaining pillars in a circle around Link, who must escape through the gaps he created earlier before Blizzetta drops herself on him, at which point he can use the ball and chain on her again. Once she's defeated, she reverts to her original form, and Yeto runs in to care for her, hugging her so hard that a heart container is created, as Link and Midna take the mirror to let the couple be. Back in Telma's bar, Link learns that Russell's investigating the sacred grove that Link found the Master Sword at, which seems to have the next shard of the mirror. While his first trip to the grove used Midna's jump ability, with Russell watching, Link must instead make the trip by flying across the Golden Cucko, which is a fun little platforming challenge. In the Lost Woods, Skull Kid reappears and is fought in the same way as first time, but Link isn't locked in his wolf form, and as such needs to use the bow and arrow against Skull Kid when he's out of reach. Upon returning to the Master Sword's pedestal, Link can stab it to remove a statue in the area, opening a strange door to the past. When he passes through, he enters the Temple of Time. Upon striking a sunken pedestal, Uku and her son Uku Jr. run into Link. I've neglected to mention them before, but the pair appear as an optional item in prior dungeons, and can be used to warp out of them at any time. Uku belongs to a race of bird people called the Uka, who allegedly live in a city in the sky and preceded the creation of Hyrule. In this instance, the duo believe that the Temple of Time contains a piece of their race's technology that can return them to their home in the heavens. 
While irrelevant now, keep it in mind. Unlike its ocarina counterpart, the Temple of Time is an actual dungeon, a huge tower that Link must climb. The door to the boss area is on the bottom floor, but a statue needed to open it is mysteriously absent. On the way up, the dungeon really doesn't have much to it. There's a lot of switches that open gates when heavy objects are placed on them, and a fun room where Link needs to shoot arrows through holes in the walls to move the walls, plus a little puzzle where he needs to throw weights around a scale to raise them up, but it's honestly nothing special. That all turns around on the top on the 8th floor though, starting with the mid-boss. In its first form, the Dark Knight is armored and shielded, and has a variety of ways to remove its armor. Waiting for its sword to get stuck on the floor, bomb arrows, or even just backslashing and helm splitting. Once its heavy armor is removed, it becomes much faster and more aggressive, and Link will need to time slashes between its fairly dangerous attacks to take it out. Link's reward for defeating the Dark Knight is the Dominion Rod, which allows him to possess statues that have holes in them. In this dungeon, primarily small ones that were used earlier to depress switches, and the large statue that's missing from the start of the dungeon. These possessed statues will mimic his movements, including making the large statue swing its hammer, which can destroy pretty much the whole dungeon, from the moving walls to enemies. There's a good catharsis in smashing the dungeon to pieces on the way down, while moving the statue to bells to teleport it to the next room. The most notable part here is taking the scale back, which requires a lot more work to balance when dragging the statue down to the bottom. With the statue returned, Link can fight the boss, Twilight Arachnid, Armagoma, an evolution of Ocarina of Time's first boss, Goma. Armagoma spawns smaller babies to harass Link while it crawls around on the ceiling and will periodically shoot lasers at Link, who can take that opportunity to shoot it in its exposed eye on its back and knock it to the ground. Much like an ocarina, but its armored shell is too tough to crack, and Link will need to use the giant statues in the room to pummel the flip spider, which can also be used to destroy its babies. Once it's been pummeled enough, the eye itself pops out and begins to crawl around with its swarm of children, but there's no puzzle here, just attacking it with whatever the player wants, sword, arrows, or even the statues in the room, giving Link the next mirror. Shard. Outside of the Temple of Time, Uku sees the Dominion Rod hoping to use it to return home, but realizes that Link's usage has drained its power and she runs off to search for new leads. While the spinner is mostly useless outside of its dungeons, the Dominion Rod is basically a paperweight for now. In order to restore its power, Link seeks out Shad, who's an expert in the subject of the city in the sky. Shad lacks the ability to help, but mentions that something Ilya said could help, but Link will need to restore her memory first. This involves a small item chain, a note from Renato to Telma, an invoice from Telma to the doctor, getting a scent from the doctor's wall, talking to Telma's cat, then killing some skeleton dogs to get a sex toy. The sex toy reminds Ilya of the hidden village where she was imprisoned, and Link goes to rescue the other person she was captured with, who turns out to be Impaz, descendant of Impa, who's awaiting a prophesied person to bring her the Rod of the Heavens. Impaz gives Link an item that Ilya gave her, and giving it back to Ilya restores her memory. The item it turns out is a horse whistle, usable at any time, although kinda too late in the game considering it has fast travel. With Ilya's memory restored, Link must then return to Impaz with the Dominion Rod, and she'll happily gift him the ancient skybook, her role fulfilled, although it would have been nice if she could have just done that the first time we were there. Shad reads the book aloud, attempting to move a statue in Renato's basement that he believes has ties to the Sky City, but it fails. As it turns out, the words in the book were actually to power up the Dominion Rod again. Shad also asks Link to research a handful of other owl statues across Hyrule, each of which hides a character to the word to unlock the statue in Renato's basement, as well as each having a puzzle tied to it for something like a heart piece. After visiting all of these, Link can move the final owl and finds a broken down cannon. By warping the cannon to Lake Hilia, Link can pay a clown 300 rupees to fix it and launch himself into the sky, with Uko and Uko Jr. tagging along. City in the Sky is kind enough to have a simple hub with a shop to prevent the player from having to excessively take the cannon, and Link's first trip to the city starts with a cutscene of a dragon flying overhead. An awesome way to introduce the dungeon's boss, who can be seen flying in the distance from most of the Sky Islands, which is a fantastic little detail. Being high in the sky, the dungeon is filled with gaps and pits. Outside, wind will also blow regularly, potentially pushing Link off if he isn't using the iron boots, which come back in big ways throughout the dungeon. Interior rooms tend to have falling platforms and make heavy use of the claw shot, plus a few Uka flight segments. There's nothing excessively complex, but they are fun gimmicks, especially hanging from switches to free spinning fans to lower Link through them. Erolfos is the mid-boss, but two more appear later in the dungeon as regular enemies, which is pretty neat. Erolfos is a flying lizard that will repeatedly dive-bomb Link, but before doing so will raise its shield, allowing Link to claw shot it out of the air and begin wailing on it. Killing the first Erolfos gives the claw shot a huge upgrade, a brother. The double claw shot is the claw shot again, but Link can now shoot it again while he's hanging from the first claw shot point. The double claw shot is incredibly fun, and most of the dungeon after this is just a playground of places to jump between with the double claw shots. The dungeon's boss, which has been built up really well throughout the whole dungeon, makes good use of this new toy too. The battle against Twilight Dragon Argorok takes place on the roof of one of the city's buildings, with four huge pillars on each side, but no walls. 
Link must use the double claw shot to climb between the towers, and when Argrok comes close, he can hookshot his tail, then by equipping the iron boots, he can drag the dragon to the ground, smashing his armor. After doing this twice, the dragon sheds his armor entirely. From here, P-Hats, small flying plants float around the area, and Link needs to swing between them to outrun Argrok's attacks and get behind him to strike his back. It's an impressive looking fight, and the double claw shot makes it inherently fun, but as with all the other bosses, it's difficult. He's kind of a joke. The guy never even came close to hitting me, and I'm not that good at this game. With that, Link and Min have the last mirror shard and can finally reach the Twilight Realm. The intro to the Palace of Twilight is refreshingly brisk. Link and Minna can warp directly to the top of the Arbiter's Ground, where they'll meet the Sages again. The Sages apologize to Minna for cursing the Twilight Realm with Ganondorf, and refer to her as the Twilight Princess, revealing who she actually is, the leader of the Twilight. This is basically the completion of a great arc from Minna, from using Link to her own ends to save her own world, to coming to generally care for him and wanting to save the world of light alongside her own. It's a great piece of storytelling despite how understated it is. Link reassembles the mirror and crosses the barrier of Twilight. The realm itself has a very distinct look. It's got the same techno look that the Twilight enemies have had before, and even Twilight version of the enemies from the Light World, like Deku Baba's with red techno lines. At the start of the world, Minna also asks Link to allow her to continue hiding in his shadow out of shame for Miriam form, which is a cute little moment. The dungeon itself isn't crazy or anything, the first portion revolves around the city's energy source's soul. A small obstacle course leads up to the soul, with dark energy that forces Link into wolf form when he touches it spread around as an obstacle. Once he reaches the soul, Link will need to fight the mid-boss, Phantom Zant. Phantom Zant is a projection of Zant who spawns in other enemies. Once they're defeated, he will prepare to summon more and be vulnerable to attack, it's that simple. After defeating Phantom Zant, Link can attack this weird hand statue to retrieve the soul. Once he has it, the hands, wallmaster-like enemies called Zant's hand, will begin to chase Link and try to return the soul to its starting room. The souls clear the dark energy and must be moved backwards through the obstacle course and outside to the main area. This process is done twice, including the Phantom Zant battle, but with a slightly more difficult obstacle course the second time through. By returning the second soul, Link gains a semi-permanent upgrade to the Master Sword, Light Infusion. The Light Infused Master Sword defeats all Twilight enemies in one hit and also clears the Dark Fog, which is used in the back half of the dungeon to remove barriers and solve some fairly basic puzzles. While the light infusion doesn't go away after the dungeon, it only has effect in the dungeon, so it's effectively only used here. The real gem of the dungeon is the boss, Usurper King Zant. Zant's fight is a journey through everything that's happened in the game so far, but with a goofy Zant twist, because despite being intimidating earlier, he's revealed to actually be a clown. I know some people don't like that Zant's revealed to kind of just be a minion and thought he was an actual new villain in the series, but I really do like his really goofy, weird betrayal. Zant has six phases, the first five of which are callbacks to earlier bosses and mid-bosses. In phase one, Zant takes Link back to Diababa's chamber, floating above the poison water while launching purple energy balls at Link. Being Diababa here, Zant's weakness is the same as his, a theme carrying through the rest of the fights. Link must hit Zant with his Gale Boomerang to knock him out of the sky and bash him until Zant takes him to the second phase, the magnetic platform Link fought Dangoro on in the Goron Mines. Zant will warp around the platform and stomp on it, trying to cause Link to slimp off, who must wait him out until he's short on breath to attack. Third phase is in Morpheal's underwater chamber, where Zant will raise a giant clone of his head from the ground and shoot projectiles from inside it. Link needs to throw on the Zora armor, iron boots, and then claw shot him out of whatever head he pops out of to attack him. The fourth phase goes to the forest temple again, Oops Arena, where when Zant starts shooting orbs at Link, he can roll into the pillars he's standing on to literally drop him on his head. The fifth phase is in Blizzetta's room, Zant will make himself giant and attempt to drop himself on Link. Once he lands, Link can stub his toe with the ball and chain, which will cause him to bounce around in pain while slowly shrinking, letting Link go hard on him. The final phase is unique to Zant, taking place right outside of Hyrule Castle, where Zant will teleport around and stab at Link, which Link can dodge to get some hits in. Zant will also occasionally start spinning, and Link will need to shield against it until he's worn out for the best amount of hits. Zant's a really cool and unique fight, and uses a wide variety of items, and challenges the player to remember how each boss was fought. It's a really neat and goofy bit of, I guess, fan service for the game itself. Once Zan is defeated and his magic is stolen, Midna is let down to realize she's still trapped in her imp form. Zan reveals that despite the show he put on, Ganondorf has returned to the World of Light with Midna's magic, and will be the true final boss, surprise surprise. In a rage, Midna awakens a new ability, the power of her ancestors, and inflates and pops Zan like a balloon, which probably gave someone a fetish. From here, all that's left to do is stop Ganondorf. Link and Midna arrive at the base of Hyrule Castle, but it's still blocked by Ganondorf's magic. Minda unleashes her ancestral power with the Fused Shadow, turning her into a giant monster and smashing the barrier. The dungeon itself is nothing special, really just being a formality. 
One side of the courtyard is a time waster, while the other leads to the final mid-boss battle with King Bulwin. He's fought in basically the same way as he was in front of the Arbiter's Ground, only he hits a little harder. Backslice again works a little too well on him. Even this fucking guy gets a character arc, giving in to Link's power and telling him he follows whoever has the most power, as the two part with mutual respect. <laughs> Wild. The actual dungeon only has a few floors with a few small puzzle rooms. On the bridge that leads to the boss key, Link is inexplicably outmatched by two archers and a handful of swordsmen, but is saved by the resistance members led by Russell. Despite the weird moment required to make it happen, I guess it's nice to see them in their medieval technology rocket launcher one last time. In the final room of the castle, Link and Minda finally confront Ganondorf. Minda returns Zelda's soul to her, but Ganon possesses Zelda for his first phase, turning her into Ganon's puppet Zelda. Zelda will float around the arena, either diving at Link with her sword, creating a large triangle on the ground that damages Link when it fills in, or tossing a ball of energy at Link, which is the obligatory dead man's volley every Zelda game loves so much. Link can either use a sword or an empty bottle, with the joke item being a Zelda tradition stemming back to a glitch in Link to the past, and yet another Ocarina reference as Ganon's energy balls could be parried with a bottle in that game as well, to launch the orb back at Zelda, and after a few volleys she'll take damage, then repeats. With Zelda free from his possession, Ganon skips the usual procedure and hops straight into his Dark Beast Ganon form. This is the obligatory Don't Forget Wolf Link phase. Ganon will pop out a portal he creates in the room and charge Link. While Link can shoot him in the face with arrows at first to stun him and expose his stomach to attacks, Ganon will eventually begin dodging, requiring Link to do the rest as Wolf Link if he wasn't from the start. Ganon will continue to charge at Link, and Wolf Link must grab Ganon like the goats from Ordon or the Gorons and flip him over to expose his stomach. After this defeat, Ganondorf is put into his ethereal form, and Midna returns Zelda's life to her before turning herself back into her monster form to fight Ganon, while warping Link and Zelda away. From Hyrule Field, Link and Zelda see Hyrule Castle get destroyed before Ganondorf re-emerges from the wreckage on horseback, carrying the fused shadow. The opponent arrives as Zelda prays to the Spirits of Light who give her the Light Arrows. Dark Rider Ganondorf will attempt to outrun Link and Zelda while summoning Ghost Horsemen to attack them. While in range and locked on, Zelda will charge a light arrow and shoot it at Ganondorf, allowing Link to get in hits until he falls off his horse and the final confrontation begins. Dark Lord Ganondorf is a straightforward one-on-one -on -one sword fight, with Ganondorf wielding the Sword of Sages, the same weapon the Sages tried to execute him with that gave him his chest scar. There's no real thrills to the battle, Ganon can attack with lunges, kicks, and spin attacks, and after, if Link dodges, he gets a chance to get a few hits in. It's a good simple battle to end the game on, and also has an easter egg. Ganondorf can be distracted with the fishing rod, allowing Link to hit him for basically free. Upon stabbing the sword into his chest, Ganondorf refuses to go down, but of all things, Zant's ghost appears. When Zant cracks his own neck, Ganon seems to instantly die. It's a weird and fitting end to the Demon King to see him go out betrayed by his own minion. Minna is revived into her original form, and Link and Zelda see her off back to the Twilight Realm. But at their tearful departure, Minna shatters the Mirror of Twilight to protect both worlds. Perfectly, satisfyingly bittersweet, and likely the best story Zelda has told, and perhaps the best it will tell given Breath of the Wild. Not only that, but the suite of bosses, especially the final, are all fantastic. From here the credits roll, showing Hyrule free from darkness again, with various characters met throughout the game making appearances, even down to King Baldwin, apparently reformed, ending with Link returning the Master Sword and riding into the distance to find new adventures. As if everything I went over was enough, there's also a slew of optional content to tackle as well. There's an optional mini-dungeon, the Cave of Ordeals, which is 50 floors of increasingly difficult combat. On every 10th floor, Link meets a great fairy who fills one of the ponds the Spirits of Light reside in with fairies. On floor 50, Link has one of his bottles filled with great fairy teals, which heal him fully and double his attack temporarily, and he can fill one bottle with tears for each Cave of Ordeals completion, up to four. There are various optional items and upgrades, usually tied to minigames as well. Link can get the Hawkeye, a telescope that can be combined with the bow to make it into a sniper by shooting targets in Kakariko, the Magic Armor, which has a whole quest chain based around upgrading the Malamart through donations, being able to save some rupees by doing the infamous Springwater mission, one hit and it's over for the most part on that damn thing, but with the spectacular award of armor that drains rupees instead of health when damaged. There's three extra bottles, one bought from the lamp oil guy, one fish out of the fishing hole, and one as a reward for the poke quest. There's two extra bomb bags allowing Link to hold all three bomb types at once, one for doing a mini game of bombing rocks from a boat, and one for saving a Goron from eternal slumber at the bottom of Zora's domain, plus expanded bomb bags for scoring well in the boat shooting minigame. 
There's two expanded quivers for completing the Star Game, a minigame using the claw shots to collect glowing orbs in the cage, and two wallet expansions, both tied to Agatha's bug collection. As if those upgrades weren't enough, there's 45 pieces of heart to collect. Unlike other games, each fifth piece makes up an extra heart instead of fourth. Each dungeon has two heart pieces, which are often the hardest to reach chests in the area and often have nice brain teasers, while the rest are spread throughout the overworld or tied to minigames like the damn barrel carrying, goat herding rematch, 1000 rupee donation that can only be done in very slow increments of 50, flight by foul, a kaku gliding game, and various mini dungeons called caverns, like this really cool, pun intended, ice block pushing one. Additionally, outside of the first, the hidden skills are optional and are found by tracking down howling stones and then meeting the golden wolf. Needless to say, Link gets absurdly kitted out by doing the optional content, and while some of the minigames are a little frustrating, the rewards are satisfying as hell, and a lot of the exploration puzzles are really fun. There's also a few other quests to engage in, so we'll start with the Poe Hunt. Poe's can be sensed by Link while he's in wolf form and return to Giovanni for two rewards, a bottle filled with Great Fairy Tears of 20, and 200 rupees anytime Link wants indefinitely for returning the full 60. While indoor poses are fine as they always appear, the Poe Hunt is heavily weighed down by the Poe's only appearing at night. Unlike Ocarina, which this game was heavily influenced by and came out 10 years before this game, Twilight Princess has no method of time advancement. That means lots of waiting, getting to a Po location, and then standing still and waiting. Most of the locations aren't so bad, but holy hell the waiting. <laughs> Agatha's bug hunt isn't nearly as bad. There's 12 bugs, each of which come in gendered pairs for a total of 24. Bugs are often found simply meandering about in the overworld, with each pair being in roughly the same area. For the first bug, Agatha gives Link the first wall upgrade. Each individual bug Link brings back gives him 50 rupees, although it will give him 100 if it's a completed pair. The speed that this money is given out makes it kind of a hassle to spend it all, especially given the 600 rupee cap, which was increased in the Wii U version. Upon giving her the final bug, Agatha gives Link the even bigger wallet, 1000 mags. Lastly, there's two fishing quests, filling out the fishing journal by bobber fishing and getting some extra lures at the fishing hole. I'm not much for fishing, virtual or real, but apparently a lot of people like the fishing in this game. While the amount of collectibles the game has might be a bit excessive, I think generally all this extra stuff is pretty great, especially the optional caverns and finding the hard pieces. Also, here's a sloppy transition into Twilight Princess HD. I don't own it, although it seems to be the best way to play it. Besides being in HD and on a console that has an HDMI port, Link can hold three items at a time instead of two. The Wii U gamepad displays the dungeon map and has quick inventory and transformation buttons. There's a hero mode which doubles the amount of damage Link takes, prevents hearts from dropping, and mirrors the game to match the Wii version. It has Miiverse stamps in some chests to replace the piles of rupees that Link never needs. The wallet sizes have been increased for all tiers, the tier of light bug hunts have gone from 16 bugs to 12, there's a new optional item called the Poe Lantern which helps track down Poes on top of an area Poe counter to help too. Many games and side quests are marked on the map, and finally, amiibo support, controversial topic. Where most games only put cosmetics behind amiibos, Twilight Princess HD hides some content, and while the biggest piece, locked behind the Wolf Link amiibo, came packed with the game, digital buyers got completely screwed and the amiibo became in very high demand as you can imagine. Once a day, Link or Toon Link can be scanned to refill Link's arrows, and Zelda or Sheik to restore all hearts. Ganondorf can be scanned to double the damage Link takes, which stacks with Hero Mode for an extra hard mode of sorts. Most infamously, Wolf Link's amiibo unlocks the Cave of Shadows, a sort of sequel to the Cave of Ordeals, but done exclusively as Wolf Link. The ultimate reward for all this is yet another wallet upgrade, but Link also gets plenty of rupees for this trouble. It's safe to say that despite the questionable practice of locking an entire mini dungeon behind amiibos, the HD version is definitely the one to play if possible. Around the release of Twilight Princess HD, the game finally got its manga adaptation too, which is still ongoing, although seemingly drawing to a close. I read what I could find easily online, although I didn't look too hard, but even some of the translated stuff isn't easily available. The art in the series is fantastic, and I really like the usage of sharp edges to give it all a little bit of bite. The art also captures the essence of the game really well, despite its lack of color, which was part of what made Twilight Princess so striking with its heavy use of bloom and contrast of the blues and blacks and the like, darker green Twilight areas. The manga starts in the Twilight Realm and explains how it came to exist, as well as showing Zant's betrayal of Midna, who despite being leader is less powerful than Zant and feels hopeless because of it, which is actually a decent way to start things off, especially considering most who read it are probably familiar with the game. Also, Midna has a pet wolf before she meets Link, weird coincidence, even weirder coincidence that it turns out to be the reincarnated form of Ocarina of Time Link. 
Link talks in the manga and basically starts off as Goku or Luffy. He's always hungry and always begging for money, at least at first, but I imagine this is setting up contrast for the end of story. It feels a little bit wrong, but it's okay for the most part. There's a lot of backstory filled in, how Link came to Ordon and the like, which I guess is necessary when trying to make meaningful additions to a game that already has a fairly strong narrative. The game's moderate Link harem horniness is also increased a little, while also seemingly have Link reciprocated a little bit more too. Link being kept track of by the hero spirit and also being the one to accidentally revive him is a nice detail as well. The manga is a bit more violent too, Link gets his arm chopped off and the first wolf transformation has a hard body horror vibe. Plus when Ganondorf is banished to the Twilight Realm his fucking face comes off. I'm really surprised Nintendo signed off on this, although I guess they're a little more lax with the manga considering Pokemon adventures and everything. It's pretty cool though. These are just some general thoughts, I couldn't finish the manga, I, I really only read through the first two volumes of Seven online, which only covers through Death Mountain, but I think what I read is solid enough that I may look into reading it when it finishes. Twilight Princess would receive heaps of praise on release, and much like Wind Waker's criticism shaped it, it would go on to shape Skyward Sword, keeping the popular emphasis on character and story while somewhat backing off of the perceived darker tone, although I'd still call it more somber than dark or edgy. Twilight Princess was also intended to have a Majora's Mask-esque sequel, but for some reason Miyamoto pushed the team to make Link's crossbow training instead, and apparently even fought against that game having boss fights. The game maintains popularity, and its designs are even stuck in Smash Bros, with Link, Zelda, Ganondorf, and even Sheik, who doesn't appear in Twilight Princess, getting changed to the style in Brawl and maintaining those designs in Smash 4. Not to mention the Bridge of Elden stage, Midna becoming the Sis Trophy, and slews of music. Because Skyward Sword was so influenced by Twilight Princess, and Skyward Sword's reception heavily influenced Breath of the Wild's sweeping changes to the Zelda formula, this game could even be considered the genesis of that. Twilight Princess will undoubtedly continue to maintain its popularity with fans for the rest of time. The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess is a fantastic addition to the franchise, probably the best. My personal favorite if nothing else. While there are some rough spots, too many collectibles, the intro, some of the wolf parts, there's still so much good. A genuinely well told but simple story with good characters and heart, a huge world to explore, fun items, huge dungeons, and some wonderful puzzles, not to mention absolutely fantastic music. It's genuinely bordering on masterpiece status, and it's probably something that everyone needs to play.